Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I've seen some spectacular sweaters today. I hope you remember to get your picture taken. Join us as we sing. Um, our program is in two parts. We've got some carols. This is the second week of Advent as we celebrate our coming King. And uh, the second portion will be some praise and worship. So join us. Um, stand and sing. Come thy long expected Jesus. today. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home there's thus found no room for thy holy nativity. Touch. 
This one you will know. Joe. 
can never have too many carols at this time. I don't think. Please sit down. Welcome to our service today. And, and we'll invite our boys and girls to uh, head on out to uh, OCC. Wow, I love your uh, sweater, <laughs> Marianne. Lights up. So I invite our boys and girls to head out to uh, OCC Kids. Uh, there's nursery down that way and everything else is down that, that way. Um, heads up for parents uh, for the next few weeks during, during Advent. Uh, OCC Kids registration as you come in is going to be down the hall where it was uh, a few week, weeks weeks ago. It's just too many things happening out in, in the en en entrance way. If you uh, haven't had your uh, pic picture taken, uh, make sure you uh, get your picture taken after after the service. The, the 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 backdrop there. You don't have to have an ugly Christmas sweater to get your picture taken. Uh, just feel feel free to do 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 that, and it'll be great. This afternoon at uh, two o'clock, uh, John, John and Wendy Blythe are leading a grief grief share, and uh, I know we have a number of folks si signed up. If you haven't signed up, still come on out. Uh, there there there. There's, there's a fair bit of space, and so uh, I invite you to be, be part of that. Um, there's uh, some um, little flyers uh, out at the wel welcome table uh, promoting our, our, our Christmas Eve. And so if you want to take that and as a, something to hand to people, to give to people, to, to as, as you're inviting them to our Christmas Eve service, that's obviously de December 24th at, uh, at 5, 5.30 p.m.
And if you're visiting with us, there's a, a welcome card in the chair rack in front of you. And I invite you to fill that in with your contact information. And there's a small gift out there. A couple of uh, other quick, quick announcements. One, um, we're becoming a, a, a church where there's more and more need to help people with rides. And so if you're able to give people uh, rides to church, uh, let, 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 us, let us know. Um, some, sometimes because of physical uh, disability and not mobility issues during the winter uh, and for, for other, other reasons. So uh, if you're uh, available for that, that'd be awesome. The other thing uh, to, I want to announce is our, our, our Christmas offering. In the last couple of years, we've done a, a, a special designated Chris Christmas offering, which, which we split. And so half of it gets used for, for ministry here in, in, in Aurelia, for, for benevolence. We're part of, a, as, a, as a church, part of something called a shared assistance tracking sheet, which, which helps people in need. And so people who have a particular financial need uh, get vested by either the Salvation Army or the St. Vincent de Paul Society. So uh, uh, basically that means the rest of the churches that are involved in that don't have to do all the research and say, you know, to contact hydro or water and say, is this a legitimate thing? They've already done all that. And, and so half of the money we re will receive during our Christmas offering will go towards that. And the other half we want to use to uh, give towards I Live Again Uganda. And uh, talking talking to them this last week, they said the big need we have right now is, is not, not a physical project, uh, but we would love to uh, uh, fund the, the pastor's conference in, in February. And uh, um, I, I'm, I'm speaking at, at, that, at that pastor's conference. And they're bringing, I think it's 23 pastors, um, mostly rural pastors, uh, some uh, from South Sudan and, and who are living in the refugee camp uh, and, and pastoring people in those, those camps. You know, some of those camps up uh, in the north part of Uganda have 25, 30,000 people in them. And, and so we want to build, build into them. So they're going to bring these 23 pastors together and uh, provide accommodation, meals, uh, some, some, some resources. One of, one of the things we, we give them at the end, end of the week is, is, is two, two Bibles. One, uh, an, an English study Bible, uh, so they've, because that probably be the only resource they have. Uh, and the other one is a luau, which is the uh, particular language of nor northern Uganda. And so a, bi a Bible in that. And those may, uh, and in many, many cases, that's the only Bible they have. Um, and, and so we really want to want to bless them. So just mark your offering, Christmas offering, uh, if you want to give towards that pr that special over, over and above, above offering. Uh, if you're do giving it on, on, online, mark it in the memo line there as well. Over um, the season of ad Advent, uh, we used to do a last few years a, an ad Advent wreath. And as you can tell, the, the, the wreath has been deconstructed and spread out this, this, this year. And, and thanks, thanks to Joy for the, the wonderful job she, she's, she's done with that. And so... What we're doing during Advent is we're taking the, the, the four key words, hope and, and, and peace and then joy and love and then Jesus, the light, light of the world on, on Christmas Eve. And today we're focusing on peace. And so there's a white card in the chair rack in front of you. And I would encourage you to, uh, to write your prayer about peace. Let, let, me, let me read from Philippians 4. Paul tells us, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness, gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. 
The peace of God will surround you and the God of peace will be with you. So let me encourage you to, to, to write a prayer and while we're doing that, we're going to show a, a cup, couple of videos and then at some point during those videos after you've written that, I invite you to bring that prayer forward and just place it uh, some, somewhere around the, the, the peace sign. When will it end? Every morning we're greeted with a storm of conflict, tension and strife blaring at us from the TV screen, the radio, social media, the news on our phones. Every day the world is ending somewhere. Here an earthquake, there another senseless act of violence. Today a war across the sea, and tomorrow a war of wills inside the four walls of your own home. How long, O Lord? Rioting in the cities, injustice, corruption. It seems like it's all getting worse and not better. The whole creation is groaning, longing to be restored and made whole again. When you groan as you read the latest headlines about political unrest or sudden bloodshed, you're tapping into something implanted deep in the souls of all living things. You were made to long for peace. It's not supposed to be this way. When you yearn for peace and wholeness, for the shalom of all peoples, you're aching to see the kingdom come on earth. And that's the good news that was announced to the shepherds in Bethlehem, and that Jesus himself later told his followers, the kingdom we long for has come and is even now breaking into this world. It's called already, but not yet. On that winter's night in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, the Prince of Peace was born into this world as a herald of the good news, which is for all people, the sign of God's love, the seal of our redemption, the promise of eternal life, an initiation of a new reality, and a fulfillment of the coming kingdom of peace in which every tear shall be wiped away and there will be no more suffering or death. Because of Christ, we can have peace in our hearts, the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding while we await the final, the universal peace at the consummation of the kingdom when it comes in glory. This Christmas, through Jesus, we have peace. Comfort and peace, that is our cry. In a land scarred by battle, thrashed by unrest, the scourge of disorder and chaos. We are unsure of what's next. Unsettled by all that has happened, tossed about by the winds of change, rocked by the waters of chaos, longing for someone to call out. Be still. Protection for the voiceless, peace flowing through the streets, Overflowing justice, breath of Almighty, word of God. There's a voice ringing through the sky. Do you hear it? Crying out in the wilderness. What is it saying? Prepare the way. God is coming. Interrupt this chaos with your voice of peace.
Jesus, who brings peace into turmoil and conflict, we thank you for your divine peace mission. We are remembered at Christmas. We light this candle as a reminder of your promise of peace. We offer up our prayers for peace, trusting that you will act in each and every situation. Amen. Lead us in uh, some more, a couple of more songs. Then Brent is coming to uh, bring the uh, the word, the me- the mess, the message this morning. Just a reminder: as we as we focus on peace, peace means more than simply the absence of conflict. You know, the uh, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom, uh, which one of the best ways to translate that is flourishing, full health, completeness, and that's part of what we pray for, isn't it? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. So Alan and team, lead us in worship. Let's stand and do and worship him. Take 
at your word. Jesus, you have taken hold of me. All my life is in your hands. You are my strength. You are my strength. I will look up, for there is none above you. I will bow down to tell you that I need you, Jesus, Lord. Please sit down. don't need to. No, I'm good. <laughs> Looks like my kid's room up here. Holy cow, all the papers everywhere. <laughs> Can't find an artist. Anyhow. Um, a lot of you look great. I am not as festive as you. And this is my green shirt. <laughs> um, <laughs> this week we had our uh, junior youth uh, Christmas party. Uh, we had a great time together, good turnout. And one of the things that uh, Chisa, she ran the game, she did a wonderful job. And one of the games that she ran was this, um, it wasn't really a game I guess per se, it was sort of a um, uh, a way to decipher how honest we all are. Uh, so it was a list of things, 14 I believe, and one side was naughty and the other side was nice. Steve, you've done a great job. There was 14 things. Siobhan got all 14 on the nice list. She's stellar. 
I could only muster 12 on the nice list. And I'm going to tell you, I think some of you maybe need to have some conversations with your kids because all of them had like two, three at the most on the naughty side. And it's a good thing that Siobhan and I are partnering together with the junior youth because I came out on top with eight. I'm just going to let you know, I had the most on the naughty. I just feel like I was the most honest person there. <laughs> and I have the longest amount of time that I've had to incur all these naughty things anyhow. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about this morning. I just wanted you to know who, what kind of person is trying to teach you this morning. Uh, so take, take it all with a grain of salt. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, uh, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for uh, the opportunity it is to, uh, to be able to sing, sing songs to you. The, the opportunity that this season brings to remind us of, the, of the, the hope and the joy and the peace that we have in you, Lord. Um, and, the, and the love that you extend to us each and every day, Lord. So this morning, Lord, as our minds are generally pretty full at this time of year. We have different get-togethers, parties that we're thinking about. We have all the Christmas gifts and things that are still bouncing through our minds and things like that. Lord, I just pray this morning as we come to you that we can set that aside for a few moments. We can set that aside and, and just listen to your word and what you have to teach us this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever notice we live in a restless world? You know, sometimes when you hear a, a sermon or, or someone or a pastor coming to, to speak, they at times can make statements like this at the beginning of a, of a, of a sermon. And uh, then they take the first half maybe of that sermon to kind of prove that point. They might look at different articles or statistics or psychology or sociology. But I feel like if I say we live in a restless world, most everybody goes, yeah, 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 we actually do live in a restless world. And it's not just the world that's restless, right? It's us, right? We're, there's something on the inside of us that's perpetually restless. And I think the, definition, the dictionary definition of that word restless might even help us to agree together that we do live in a restless world and that we are a restless people. The dictionary defines restless in this way of an animal or human that's unable to rest or relax as a result of anxiety or boredom. We all, to some degree or another, grow restless, right, because of our anxiety and boredom. We live in a restless world, right? It's the uh, the eight-year-old that gets up for, for practice, hockey practice maybe, at six o'clock in the morning, goes to school all day, and then after school maybe has some kind of after-school program or activity, and then comes home and does some homework and goes to bed exhausted at nine o'clock at night only to get up and do it again. It's the teenager who gets up in the morning to do the activities they need to do to, to sort of, you know, pad their resume in order to get into university, works hard on getting good marks and then is involved in volunteering, sports, soccer, whatever it might be, and they're perpetually involved in that kind of stuff, and they're restless. It's the newly married couple, right, that's working 60, 70, 80 hours a week to invest in their future. They are restless. Their anxiety and their boredom gets the best of them. They're, they're driven, 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 and they're running, running, running. And they think to themselves, this is only for a season. It will slow down when we have kids. They're, we know, right? They're on a grand adventure missing the point, aren't they? That's not what kids are like, right? And you have kids, right? It's the waking up and changing diapers at, at 2 o'clock in the morning. The only private time you have is when you're in the washroom, and then it's the little knock-knock on the door, the, the, you know, the fingers that come under the door, right? And, and those kids, they grow up, and they're 8, and then they're teenagers, and you repeat the cycle again, except this time you're not the 8-year-old, the teenager, but you're the Uber driver, aren't you? And as a result of our anxiety and boredom, we're running, running, running. And all the time, we can never find true rest. And that restlessness provokes some things in our lives that just aren't good, that aren't helpful, aren't constructive, that aren't healthy. And here's the deal. The pattern of restlessness and what it provokes in our life 
is not new, right? We have not found new ways to sin in the last 4,000 years, right? And nobody's finding new ways to stray from God. We're using all the old ways and expecting somehow that they kind of work for us, uh, but that's sort of the definition of insanity, is it not? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That pattern of restlessness is old stuff. In fact, the author of Hebrews talks about it in Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to look at that, the, the ways in which God's people in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, right? This is God's vision to save and redeem and rescue the world that he began to effect through a group of people, the descendants of Abraham. And they get into a little bit of a, a situation, and, and the problem that they're in is that they're in slavery in Egypt for a really long time. And finally, God sends a redeemer, a man named Moses, and he goes to Pharaoh, and after a series of what we'll call difficult conversations, God eventually effects his plan, and the people are set free from slavery in Egypt, and they begin this journey towards the promised land, towards the rest that God had designed for them. But they never really get into it. I mean, they eventually get into it, but they never really get into it. And the author of Hebrews begins to talk about that, and what the author of Hebrews does is he compares us with the nation of Israel. So Hebrews 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have to fail to reach it. For good news came to us, that's you and me, just as it came to them. That's God's people back then. But the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Right? They didn't trust. They didn't listen. For we who have believed enter that rest, and as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter rest. So God's talking about the nation of Israel. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. That's twice as God said that. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. If you're tracking with me, and I know this text is challenging, um, the author of Hebrews kind of said a lot there, did he not? The author of Hebrews said some stuff, that, and he kind of doubled back on some things. He was talking about ancient stuff, talking about future stuff. He's talking about salvation, sanctification. He's talking about big theological concepts. But listen, if you were to boil down Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and you have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a, have a, a Bible degree, right? You, you don't even have to have anything. If you just boil it down to one word, what is Hebrews chapter 4, 1 through 11 about? rest. It's about rest. It's all about solving that anxiety or boredom problem in your heart. It's about solving that pit of your stomach stuff where you just can't seem to sit down. Not just physically, right? But, but even mentally and spiritually. It's all about inviting us to enter into rest. Author of Hebrews wants us to know a couple of things. First is this, that rest is available. I think many of us don't even believe this right? We just keep running sort of on that hamster wheel of life because we think, you know, why try? Why, why even bother? It's not even available. But what did the author of Hebrews say at the very first part of chapter 4? Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, right? You see it? God still extends that promise. The promise of his rest still stands, it's available for you today. And so here's the encouragement, maybe the exhortation, right? Therefore, what? Don't harden your hearts. Don't reject it. Don't kind of put your hand up to it like it's not available. Don't look away from it. Just say, okay, God, I'm going to trust that at least, at the very least, I'll say today it's available. It doesn't have to go any further than that. Just the acknowledgement that it's available. 
Number two, rest is ordained, right? That's just a fancy word for saying that God designed it. God designed rest. God put it in place. This is God's design, God's plan, God's idea, God's invention, right? I don't feel like I have to convince you that God created naps, do I? I mean, who's not had a great Sunday afternoon nap and said, hey, I feel great. Praise God. Hallelujah, right? We've all been there. I, I do it almost weekly. Uh, I don't have to work hard to convince you that God's designed rest, right? But listen to what the author of Hebrews says. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. God designed this. God put this into the, the program of creation from day one. And if God rested, do you need rest? Right? Rest is necessary. Rest is necessary. Right? We have to have physical rest. We have to have spiritual rest. Right? We have to find the ways in which our body will kind of shut it down. Our soul will shut it down. Our spirit will shut it down and simply rest. When the nation of Israel left Egypt, they did not enter into that promised rest of God. Why? The, uh, the author of Hebrews tells us, right? And again, in the passage, he said, They shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of what? Disobedience. That's why the nation of Israel failed to enter, because they, when they got to the, the, the land of, of promised rest, right, they didn't trust God to get them in, right? They said, God's not big enough. Right? God's not strong enough. God's not going to do this. And God said, okay, because of your disobedience, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and experience restlessness, right? Without a home, with, without a place to, to set your family down, without a place to kind of put roots down and, and, and to set your soul down. And you're going to experience restlessness. And here's the cycle of restlessness for the nation of Israel, right? They disobeyed. And so they began to experience restlessness, and instead of looking at their restlessness, their boredom, anxiety, and, and that wandering for 40 years in the wilderness, instead of looking at that and going, you know what? You know what the root of this is? We disobeyed. Therefore, we're restless. So why don't we just go back, eliminate disobedience, and obey, and then we'll experience rest. Right? Instead of doing that, what they did is they tried to solve their restlessness on their own by disobedience and distraction. So here you got more disobedience and that cycle of restlessness repeats itself. The nation of Israel got restless and so somebody says, right, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm bored here. Why don't you just kind of give me all your earrings and your jewelry and, and we're just going to melt that down, create a calf and we'll worship that. Right? Moses, he's not up on the mountain for that long, but they grew restless, right? They grew restless and they lacked gratitude. They grew restless and they rejected the authority that, that God had placed over them, which was Moses and Aaron. And every time they tried to solve the restlessness themselves by disobedience, they began that cycle of restlessness over and over. And that restlessness led to discontentment. Restlessness leads, led to discontentment for the nation of Israel. Right? They weren't content with where God had them, right? They weren't content with where God was taking them. They were not content with, with what they had to eat. They weren't content with how much water they had. They, they, they weren't content with the manna that God had given them. They weren't content. And we're going to talk about phones here in a minute a bit more, but here's a good example of the ways in which we are similar to the nation of Israel. Right? We get restless, and so we distract ourselves in order to cure our own restlessness, and it causes discontentment. One of the ways that we distract ourselves is we pick up our phone and we kind of run through Facebook or, or Instagram, right? When's the last time that you got restless, right? Grabbed your phone, started flipping through Instagram, Facebook, whatever, spent 10, 15 minutes, got off of Instagram and Facebook, and said to yourself, I am more content now. Probably never, right? There's always something you need, right? Always something to buy. Always somebody who looks better than you. Somebody whose food looks great. Somebody whose kids look so cute and amazing. And somebody who looks, has a wonderful house or whatever they're doing, right? And because of our restlessness, we try to solve it ourselves. And it leads to discontentment. We try to solve discontentment with more and more and more, and it never fills up. Restlessness leads to strife in the nation of Israel. 
Right? It was rejection of Moses and Aaron. It was conflict within the nation of Israel. But when, but when we're restless and bored and anxious, right, it causes disunity uh, within the body. Right? It causes disunity within families. It leads to those types of things. Restlessness also leads to delay. When we get restless, we try to solve restlessness on our own way. And what it means is that we're not looking to God's way. Right? If we're trying to solve it our way, and it's real simple, right? If we're trying to solve it our way, we're not looking to God's way. And so here is what the nation of Israel did, right? They, they tried to solve their own, it their own way rather than looking to God's way. And it delayed them from entering God's true rest for them. It delayed them quite a bit. You know, long it, it should have taken them. And if you're not familiar, I mentioned it earlier, right? That they, they were supposed to go into this promised land that God had for them. And they disobeyed. And they wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. Do you know how long it should have taken them to get from where they were to where God had them? 11 days. Right? 11 days, because the shortest distance between two points is a, is a straight line. So if I'm restless and I just walk towards God's way and my restlessness gets solved, it should take me 11 days, by example, right? And it didn't, right? The nation of Israel, it wandered. It got distracted, disobedient, right? It kind of feels, some of you probably have experienced this, kind of feels like my son James. If we say, James, go clean your room. And we check on him maybe 10 minutes later. There's a good chance James has a Spider-Man costume on. There's a good chance James is playing mini sticks up in his room. Right? He gets distracted by the things that are all around him. And the thing that he's supposed to do never happens. And you might be thinking, it probably should take James maybe 10, 15 minutes to clean his room. No, he is like the nation of Israel. It takes him 40 years. <laughs> And because we're trying to fill our life up with something that isn't God, it delays us from entering true rest, right? Restlessness, it leads to error. And in terms of the nation of Israel, right, this is kind of silly, right? The nation of Israel, they look back at their time in Egypt, right? And they were like, hey, do you remember how great that was? Right? We used, to, we used to, to kill the fattened calf. We used to have parties, right? We used to overeat. It was great, and Moses looks at them and says, uh, no, actually, you were slaves. Uh, you were slaves. Uh, you had no land. You had no money, right? Uh, you were tortured. They actually were killing some of you, right? It wasn't great. You had to make bricks. You had to make these monuments to gods that you didn't even worship, right? And we do that in the same way, right? Our restlessness causes us to see life in a skewed way, right? We can look back at our past and think, oh, that was great. And we're going to look at our present situation and think, that was great. Or maybe look towards our future, right? And because we're restless, it leads to error, right? That's the restlessness cycle. Our disobedience leads to restlessness. Our restlessness leads to more disobedience, and the cycle goes over and over again. <clears throat> now, I don't want to get too aggressive with you and talk about sin and disobedience, <clears throat> excuse me, in ways that leads to restlessness. So we'll talk about maybe some morally neutral stuff this morning. So here's the first thing that we're going to talk about up on the screen here is this. How much time do you think the average Canadian adult spends on their cell phone each day? I'll let you know. It's four and a half hours. I know. That's crazy, right? You want to hear that in a more drastic way? The average adult will spend just over two months or 65 days of 2023 on their phone. Crazy, right? Why it gets crazier. Youth, between the ages of 12 and 17, how many hours a day do you think they spend on their phone? You're just going to like, whatever. It's like double, nine hours a day. Insane, right? We invest all this time on our phone and it doesn't work, right? Richard Foster, he's a devotional writer. He says this, our adversary, the devil, majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us in, involved in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. That means we do not, right? What else do we use to distract ourselves? Here's another one, right? Netflix. 
Could be Prime, could be Disney Plus, could be all three like we have in our house, I don't know, right? So we have a word for this, right? We don't just watch Netflix, right? We binge watch, right? Because we can just devour episodes after episodes, right? Ever gone to bed? I don't know, this is just an example. I don't know anyone who's done this, but ever gone to bed at like 10 o'clock and you think I gotta get up early in the morning and you start to do the calculations, okay, I gotta get their, you know, breakfast, their lunch is made, all this kind of stuff. If I go to sleep now, I'm gonna get eight hours of sleep. Perfect. You start to go on your phone when you lay down. Maybe you're watching a Netflix episode. Maybe you're scrolling through Insta Reels or YouTube Shorts, right? They all kind of become addictive. And it's like 10.50, okay, seven hours of sleep. That's cool, no problem, no problem, right? That's good, I can do that. Next thing you know, I can justify six hours of sleep. I can function on six hours of sleep. I've done that before. And next thing you know, you're like, okay, if I just grab a muffin and a coffee on my way into work, um, I can move my alarm back a little bit, and you know, next thing you know, it's two, three in the morning. Right, here's another one that we use for ourselves. Comfort foods, right? I'm gonna read you an excerpt from an article and I, that I came across this week, and I'm just gonna jump into the middle of it, so it's gonna seem kind of weird, right? Among top concerns tracked by the study, the cost of groceries ranked highest, which we probably all can agree with, right? 64% of respondents said they were very concerned about high grocery costs. 54% very concerned about high gasoline. 46% very concerned about high restaurant prices. Even as inflation is wreaking havoc, bakery items remain a priority for consumers. People are creating room in their budgets for these types of activities. Baked items are an affordable indulgence. Consumers have an emotional connection to bakery items. Baked foods have a high permissibility as many consumers enjoy the occasional baked treat as part of everyday life. According to the survey, 84% of consumers agrees it is perfectly fine to occasionally treat yourself with some baked treats such as cookies, cupcakes, donuts, and pie. That term, affordable indulgence, caught my eye. And we're going to talk about indulgence here, and I'm not just talking about, like, you know, like a one-off kind of thing, but like overindulgence. Think about overindulgence, right? Overindulgence will cost you something, right? If I, I, I can indulge in Instagram for a little bit, right? I can indulge in food for a little bit. I can indulge even in my job for a little bit, right? I can give myself into that, right? As, as part of my anxiety and boredom, I get restless. I, I in, can indulge maybe in a hobby, in something, right? I can go after it. I can run after it and keep after it on that sort of hamster wheel, right? And keep going and going and going and get more and more into it. And I think to myself, this isn't going to cost me anything, but it's going to cost you something, right? Overindulgence on the food side, right? That's going to cost you your waistline. Other things, maybe it's going to cost you intimacy with your spouse. It's going to cost you being a good parent. It's going to cost you your friendships. And for our purposes today, maybe it's even going to cost you relationship with God. When we indulge, 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 and when we run, 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 rather than rest. Number two is activity makes a terrible identity. Some of us, instead of looking at who we are, we try to understand who we are and live, and live as human beings. We, we, at times, can live as human doings, if you will. Right? Instead of resting in our identity as a child of God, we get engaged in activity after activity. And even when there's no activity, we still engage in activity in our mind rather than resting. And it makes a horrible identity. You know why? Because activity is temporal. Right? It's going to go away. One day, you won't be able to golf anymore. One day, you won't be able to work anymore. One day you won't be able to engage that hobby anymore, right? One day those activities are going to go away. It might be today, it might be tomorrow, it might be 30 years from now, but one day they're going to go away and what's going to stay is your identity. And so when we try to build our rest and solve our restlessness problem with activities, it breaks down, falls apart rather than focusing on our identity. So here's the solution. Jesus says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A theologian named Andrew Murray wrote a book called Abiding in Christ, and in that book he noted that there's two promises in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 30. Both of those promises are conditional. Here are the conditions. Come to me and learn from me. 
Come to me, I'll give you rest. Learn from me, I'll give you rest. Here's the difference. Come to me is that very first time where you say yes to Jesus in repentance and faith and say, you know, I've pursued maybe health and wellness on my own and I pursued a a solution to my restlessness problem on my own. I'm wandering in the wilderness just like the nation of Israel. I, I, I can't get it solved, Jesus. So what was supposed to be a short path towards rest has become this perpetual cycle of restlessness and I can't get it solved. And Jesus says, just come to me, come to me. And so for those of you who are already there, already taken that step, the second edition is learn from me. This is discipleship, right? This is take my yoke upon you, walk as I walk, talk as I talk, love as I love, allow all of my priorities and character to be your guidelines for life and you will find rest for your souls. Here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 30, it's just as simple as this. True rest is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. True rest is in Jesus and Jesus alone. There's no other way around it. We've got to tap into a God who loves us and cares for us. We've got to walk away from the ways in which we try to distract and and, and disobey and solve our own restlessness problem and walk towards Jesus. Come to him. Learn from him. I'm going to give you a couple of practical ways that, that you can do that over the next couple of weeks as we are into this busy Christmas season. First is this, take a walk. Take a walk. I know that might sound silly. Um, For some, maybe, who use to use exercise as that kind of distraction. Maybe walking doesn't even count as exercise, so maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But just go and take a walk. And the great news about walking is that it's really difficult to text and scroll, especially when you got the gloves on, right? It's really hard. So go take a walk. Enjoy God's creation. As cold or wet or rainy, whatever, or snowy, who knows what we're in for, right? However it might be, just go and take a walk. Number two, pass on the eggnog. I'm going to get to this. This will be clear in a second. When I was a kid, my dad uh, always got a couple of cartons of eggnog over the Christmas time. I think when you're young, just the name eggnog just almost is revolting, um, I think. But I can remember, like, my dad enjoyed it, so I'm like, I-, I think I should like this. And I would try and get a glass down, and it's one of those things that I thought I would like, and I kept trying, and it's like, no, not so much for me. Um, I don't know, any of you big eggnog fans? See, not too many, so I'm not alone, okay. Um, it's got this weird texture, thickness thing to it. Um, I've heard some people, this is not me, I don't know, maybe this is for you to enjoy, I don't know. But I have heard some people mix alcohol in there and maybe that's why you enjoy it a bit more, I don't know. Um, It's got like 5,000 calories in a glass. Anyhow, what I'm trying to say, what my point is, um, especially around this time of year, we can numb our restlessness with food and alcohol. Right? And that's what corporations are all about, the ads at this time, right? Hey, have this, indulge in this, indulge in that. You know, you deserve it, you earned it, you, you know, go for it, right? And they're monopolizing that, that kind of thing, right? And they, they know that. But we need to pass on it, right? Have a glass of water, whatever it might be, right? So whether it's activity, whether it's food, whatever it is, whatever that indulgence that leads you to more and more and more, pass on it and rest. Number three, be quiet. Carve out some time of your day, even those of you maybe are working a lot, just take a little 60 second um, retreat at work, you know, put everything down, put your cell phone down, turn it off or at least put it on silent because turning it off might cause some anxiety for you. I don't know, right, but just be quiet. I did this on, on Thursday night. I had gone to Barrie. I'd been uh, for work that day. That's where I was assigned. And uh, after work, I went out to do some Christmas shopping while I was down there. Came home, had dinner. And then I went upstairs uh, into my room to, to work at my desk on the sermon. Um, and I started thinking, you know what? I'm preaching on rest on Sunday, so maybe I ought to kind of give it a shot here. Uh, so I sat down in my chair and I thought, you know, I'm going to be quiet for 15 
minutes. I'm going to spend 15 minutes in quiet. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to bring any sort of confessions before God. I'm not going to do any of that. No requests. Right? I'm just going to sit here before God. I'm going to set a 15-minute timer. Um, you know what I thought? I thought this is going to be a nightmare. There's no way I'm going to get through the 15 minutes of quiet. And I fully admit it was really hard to settle in and it was hard to turn my brain off. It was hard just to kind of be quiet and rest and listen to God. But at the end of the 15 minutes, you know what I did? I actually spent a little bit more time because my body, it was hungry and desperate for rest. My soul and my spirit were hungry for rest. And I was been trying, as you are, trying to solve it on my own. All those things I talked about earlier, right? Like the phone and the food and the whatever else I talked about, I forget. But um, that's me. That's, that's, I overindulge all the time, right? And so we use all those things, right, to distract ourselves, all that activity going on and on because of our anxiety and boredom. And it may take the edge off our restlessness to a certain degree, but it's never going to solve it. And what we need is true rest. So that we sit down and to be quiet before God and just, you know, watch, right? It, it may not be the same for you, but for me, I was just like, hey, I need more of that. I need to be doing that more often. And the last one that we're going to conclude is to place your active trust in Jesus. Trust is an active thing, right? Jesus, I'm going to trust you with these outcomes in my life. Whatever's going on, right? We all pray and trust Jesus to, to intervene and to work in our life, right? And we, Jesus, I, I trust you with my children. Jesus, I, I, I trust you with my finances. Jesus, I, I trust you with my marriage. Right? We actively placing your trust in him and resting on him and taking him up on his promise. This promise. Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray. God, I just thank you. I thank you for the offer of rest. I pray that we would know collectively, uh, as your people, today that rest is not found in spiritual disciplines of quiet. It's not found in the spiritual discipline of fasting, the discipline of saying no, or the spiritual discipline of solitude or silence. But true rest is found in the object of our affections. And so in those ways, Lord, we begin to pass on the eggnog, if you will. We pass on the indulgences. We pass on the activity. And we take, and, and we just sit and be quiet. And maybe we just take a walk. We're preparing room for you to enter into our lives, Lord. And so God, give us the rest that we so desperately need this season as we prepare you room in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Brent say pass the eggnog or pass on the eggnog? <laughs> Close our service.
the sky. There is no that sets me free. Jesus Christ who lives in me. You are stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. No beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to seek and save the lost. Your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. Let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, grant us peace as we depart at this time. Thank you for this reminder that your coming to us, Lord, is near as we are in the second week of Advent. Lord, we look forward to the rest, which taking you seriously, Lord, and, and putting you first, and putting aside those things that distract. So be with us, Lord, as we depart. May you, may you keep us safe and our eyes ever on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Pray this, amen. We're going to play you out. <clears throat> Your voice and praise love.